Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Lynn Phillipson, and I'm a public health academic from the University of Wollongong. It's my pleasure today to welcome you on behalf of the Forward with Dementia team to the second webinar in our series. Forward with Dementia is part of an international campaign and program aiming to improve the diagnosis and immediate post-diagnostic supports available to people with dementia and their carers. And it has been my pleasure to be involved in this multi-country program led by Professor Henry Bradati with Professor Lee Fei Lo, Professor Yun Hee Jion and Dr. Meredith Gresham. The second webinar today in our Forward with Dementia series has been designed to act as a provocation. Today, we ask the question, why? Why is it that despite being one of the major causes of disability in Australia, that those currently diagnosed with dementia receive so few health treatments and psychosocial supports? As part of the Forward with Dementia program today, we will highlight the growing evidence that health services and psychosocial interventions are essential to maintain function and well-being in those diagnosed with dementia. In this afternoon's webinar, Professor Lee Fei Lo from the University of Sydney will describe the unmet needs that Australians diagnosed with dementia are currently experiencing. Lee Fei is well placed to provide this presentation this afternoon. She is a professor in ageing and health at the University of Sydney and the author of the groundbreaking first edition, Dementia and Rehabilitation, Evidence-Based Interventions and Clinical Recommendations. Lee Fei will highlight the strong evidence base that underpins the use of a number of interventions this afternoon, including physical activity, cognitive stimulation therapy, occupational therapy, and carers programs, and their, enrol their role in improving outcomes for those diagnosed with dementia. We hope you, that you will enjoy her focus on practical suggestions on how clinicians like you can help people with dementia and their carers access rehabilitations and supports, including through the use of the patient information, tools and resources offered on our new Forward with Dementia website. And we'll put that website link in the chat for you. During Lee Fei's presentation, we encourage you to write any questions that you have for our live Q&A panel at the end of the session in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll then be able to answer these within our panel discussion at the end of the session. But Lee Fei would also like you to please place any comments or suggestions or thoughts in the chat function as well. And she'll look to interact with you during this presentation. So without any further delays, I'll hand over the reins now to Lee Fei to start her presentation. Thanks, Lynn. Hi, everyone. It's, um, it's good to have you here this evening. I'm just moving the heads around so that I can look myself. Here we go. Um, so I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, which for me here in Lilyfield are the um, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and elders past, present and emerging, and any First Nations people here with us today, and all of you as well, our, our colleagues. Um, it's, good, it's good to all be here today. To start with, I'd like you to to chat with me, please. Um, you should have permissions in the chat. And I'd like you to think about the word dementia and share with us all um, the words and feelings that first come to mind when you see or hear the word dementia. Please put them in the chat. I'm reading the chat now. Scared, fear. Thank you, Cheryl and Jane. Demise, uncertainty, frustration, progressive deterioration, grief, cognitive issues, lonely, carers, fear, forgetfulness, brain illness, grief and loss, negative, uncertainty, frustration, support, every second counts, RACF, stigma, misunderstanding, memory loss, loss of functioning, change of relationships, progressive, things will go downhill. No. 
Yeah, so thank you for sharing those, everyone. Connection, unpredictable, loss of independence, change in the way of seeing the world, loss of independence, misunderstood, grief, yeah, overwhelming sadness. Yes, don't have to worry about the day anymore. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> Role change, people stay away, regret, shame. Thanks, please keep putting them in the chat. Um, so this is a question that we've been asking people and we have been getting kind of similar answers to those that you're sharing today. And I'll, I'll read them after as well, if you want to keep putting them in the chat. Um, so the next question is, um, what, when you see the word post-diagnostic support for people with dementia, what things come to mind? Non-existent. Thank you, Anne. Nothing. Thanks, Jackie. Insufficient. Link to services is a must. Dementia Australia, a few people seeing Dementia Australia, can't find information. Patchy, what's that? People don't know who to contact. Your GP can follow up. Lack of knowledgeable health professionals. It's hard to navigate. This is where I can make a difference. Thank you, Vasi. Um, some allied health stuff here. OT, physical rehab, Dementia Australia, ACAT, psychological, not seen as important by medical professionals, psychoeducation, promote independence, confusion, doesn't happen, counseling, no clear systems, dementia advisors, shout out to the dementia advisors, target daily functioning. People don't see the value of rehab, finding out how to continue to live well, it's vital. Thank you, Henry Ford with dementia. We'll talk about that. Your daughter can take care of that. Well, they can't do everything. Frustrating, perseverance, hard to navigate. Thank you, everyone. Please keep putting things in the chat. We've also been asking people about this question. So when we ask people about their support, what they think about dementia, um, we often, people tell us about the cognitive symptoms. They might tell us about confusion, talk about memory loss. Um, they will sometimes tell us about the sim other symptoms of dementia um, and, and functional issues. Um, sometimes people say it's brain disease, not so often, but we do have it. I mean, that's the thing that as health professionals, they teach us. Dementia is a neurodegenerative brain condition. So I think we sometimes hear about the brain. Um, and lots of people do tell us things that you also put in the chat about grief and loss and sadness. And I guess these really negative feelings, fear that come with dementia. Um, and these are the images that we often see in the media as well. Um, and so if I just draw your attention to the, the, the diagnostic criteria for major neurocognitive disorder, which is what DSM kind of calls dementia, uh, many of you you'll all know that um, the first criteria for di diagnosing dementia is significant cognitive decline from a previous level of performance in one or more cognitive domains, listed the co cognitive domains there. And I think that very prominent in how we think about dementia is that it's a, a disorder of cognition, which it is. And it's a brain disorder of cognition, which it is. Uh, and cognition is the most frequent primary outcomes of trials of um, pharma pharmacological, but also non-pharmacological interventions for people with dementia. And I think what's missed is, you know, not missed, but we kind of neglect the, the second diagnostic criteria for dementia, that the cognitive deficits interfere with independence and everyday activities, that dementia is a condition that brings Upon, brings upon a functional decline. Um, and I, I love these pictures that I found of this lovely lady who is um, battling dementia, according to the Daily Mail article, using post-it notes. But she's, she's found a strategy to manage her, her functional decline. I showed this lovely photo of how she's put pictures of what's inside her cupboard so she can find her way around her kitchen. You can see behind her the pictures as well. Um, the functional decline isn't just in the house. People have trouble when out and about. You know, for example, uh, use driving is a major issue that people have talked about, and you know, we need other transport options. 
Um, this is a picture from the, the Hit Australian series, um, Pack to the Rafters, now called Back to the Rafters. And I showed Ted, who you can see in the bottom right. Um, his character has dementia and it shows, I guess, how um, the dementia has affected his social functioning and how he interacts with his family. Even in this kind of happy family snap, you can, you can see how he's portraying the dementia. A lot of people with dementia and their carers tell us about how dementia affects their social lives, their friends sometimes fall away, and sometimes they feel isolated and lonely. Um, I think for health professionals, we also remember that dementia makes it harder for people with dementia to communicate with us professionals and to um, ask questions and to kind of share their preferences. So that's, that's a functional kind of difficulty as well. And so I kind of want to challenge uh, our thinking about what dementia is and move from this very cognitive model of dementia, you know, that, to kind of thinking more broadly beyond that, keep the cognitive model, but also kind of thinking of this psychosocial model of dementia, which lots of other people have also been writing about and thinking about um, and, and start to think of dementia as a psychosocial kind of, you know, um, challenge as well. So Cognizance is a five country study um, led by Professor Brudati here in Sydney. And our aim um, in this first trench of surveys and interviews was to understand the experience and diagnosis and nature of support in the 12 months after diagnosis in dementia. And we asked those questions that I asked you and they told us very similar things, I think, around post-diagnostic support. Um, just so I can share the sample, we surveyed um, a, a modest number of people with dementia and carers and health and social care practitioners. And we also talked to some of them in depth um, in interviews and focus groups. This was all done kind of online. So the sample is not representative. It really represents people who are already kind of pretty good at negotiating online in the system. They were English speaking, predominantly Caucasian. They were digitally literate, had higher education SES, tended to be younger than a, a typical person with dementia. So just to summarize the key points, because Henry presented them in our last webinar, um, more than three quarters of people we surveyed were dissatisfied with the information they got after diagnosis. About 30, only about 30% of them got a care plan after diagnosis. Um, being told the diagnosis is devastating for many people with strong negative emotions. Though so some people were also relieved to have a, a reason for this, for these symptoms. Um, the professional said what you said, there's actually a lack of support pathway after diagnosis. And there was a disconnect between the services that provide diagnosis and the post-diagnostic services. And people had to find their way to Dementia Australia, which, you know, when they found the way there, usually very positively talked about or, or dementia advisors, but finding the way there was a challenge. Um, and there was also some critique of GPs not having the right knowledge and skills to provide support for people after dementia, even though often people were sent back to GPs for follow-up because that's what the system kind of expects. Um, they told us what you told us today. Information is hard to find, generic, not local, relational, and meaningful. So when our team went through, and I guess, and did some more analysis of what people wanted after dementia, um, sorry, and the system's hard to navigate and geared towards people with moderate to severe dementia, um, we, we kind of drew this ideal model of post-diagnostic support. People really wanted a one-stop shop where they got emotional support, information, navigation, a plan, and that you know this one-stop shop was, was person-centered. It was tailored to the time and the person. They wanted it to be high quality. They wanted personalized referrals to the next, um, to the next service so they didn't have to tell their story over and over again. And they really wanted information about local services. They wanted it all in one place if possible. Um, and the things they wanted besides all this were they wanted health services medical services. Some people who knew about them talked very positively about allied health, like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and people sometimes also talked about, and in professionals talked about the need for services relating to behavior as well, so it'd be mass. Um, a lot of people with dementia and carers in particular talked about the need for emotional support 
to adjust to the diagnosis and perhaps for pre-existing kind of depression and anxiety, which might have resurfaced after the diagnosis or be triggered by the diagnosis. Um, so a shout out, a uh, reminder that Dementia Australia now have a six month, six session post-diagnostic counseling program. Um, so, you know, that, that service is now available. It is um, by phone or by video chat. Um, People with dementia and carers in particular talked about how to tell their family, really needing support from their family or not getting support from their family. And people who had been to support groups, you know, tended to say quite positive things about them. Um, certainly professionals, but some people with dementia and carers talked about the need um, to have information and support around decision making and future planning financial, legal, retirement, end of life conversations. A lot of people talked about driving in particular, um, driving assessment and needing, I guess, alternative transport solutions, but also help with cleaning, shopping, respite. And there was a whole lot of conversations about navigating the aged care system as well. And they also wanted information about lifestyle, living well, exercise, diet, activities and clubs and travel. And so, I guess this is what ideally people want from post-diagnostic support from, from our study. Um, so I think it's left us, you know, kind of reframing post-diagnostic support from thinking about cognition and brain health, which is, is important and we're not gonna drop that, but thinking more broadly around function and overall well-being, and that post-diagnostic support really needs to support that second diagnostic criteria of function for people with dementia as well. And I'd like to challenge our thinking, I guess, into reframing post-diagnostic support as post-diagnostic rehabilitation and support. And I'm going to take a really broad definition. This is the broad WHO definition of rehabilitation. So WHO says that rehabilitation is a set of measures that assists individuals who experience or are likely to experience disability to achieve and maintain optimum functioning and interaction with the environments. So I'll read that again. Measures that assist individuals who experience or are likely to experience disability to achieve and maintain optimum functioning and in interaction with the environment. So really, we're trying to help people, support people with dementia to live as good a life as they can and the environment supports them to do it. So rehabilitation prevents the loss of function, slows the loss of function, improves or restores function, compensates for loss function, maintains current function. And we're getting a growing body of evidence, I guess, around evidence for rehabilitation. I'm not going to talk about medications, behavioral support, care support. There's lots of literature out there already. Um, I'm going to talk about cognitive focused interventions, occupational therapy, exercise, and psychological interventions today. And the three in red, I think there's pretty good evidence for now, and there's less evidence, I think, for psychological interventions. Let me, let me talk you through each one. So like I said, um, cognition has been the, the primary outcome for the majority, I guess, many, many of the non-pharmacological intervention studies for people with dementia. Um, we can group them into three, three major groups, I guess. Cognitive training, think of it as brain training. Cognitive stimulation therapy, which I'll explain in more detail, and cognitive rehabilitation. They all have cognition in them, but they work quite differently. And I direct you to um, Dr. Alex Baha Fuchs's um, review, which is excellent, which explains kind of the differences in detail. But let, let, me, have a, let me have a stab at it. So cognitive training is when you support the person to, to practice one or more cognitive processes. Could be memory, could be speed, could be you know, visual memory, could, and you repeatedly practice these tasks. Do so you get better at it? Um, the way we used to practice handwriting, I guess, as kids, or you practice memorizing you know, the, 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 the alphabet or the times tables. Um, so they can be done pen, pencil and paper or computerized. And um, there's variety in the programs, in the number of sessions, uh, in what happens. It's 
uh, in the trials, they're often tested on site by trained administrators as someone to support the person to do the brain training and um, some, quite often actually in groups. So this is cognitive training. And there's a lot of studies on cognitive training, 20, 33 studies, over 2,000 people. Um, and uh, the pooled meta-analysis suggests a small to moderate effect on global cognition, MMSE essentially, immediately after um, training. And then that, that's maintained between three and 12 month follow-up. Um, there's also a moderate effect on verbal semantic fluency immediately and at follow-up, um, but low evidence, I guess, for um, me measures of clinical uh, disease severity. So, um, so a global rating scale, basically, of dementia severity and a limited training transfer beyond the immediate training task, meaning if you train someone's memory, then um, they don't get better at speed. Or if you train someone's visual attention, they don't get better at prospective memory. So whatever the bit you train, you get better at. And so I, I always think of this as, you know, if you give someone a hand exercise, the hand will get stronger. And if you want their shoulder to get stronger, you give them a shorter exercise. So that, that's how kind of in my head, you know, this cognitive training works. Um, from Amit Lampet, who has also done some of these reviews, I asked him, well, if I wanted to give my patient um, self-administered brain training programs, because it's really hard to find a, you know, a supported brain training program available for people after dementia, what works? And these are the ones that Ahmed recommended. So Brain HQ, CogniFit, and Happy Neuron. I haven't used them myself, but these are the ones that Ahmed Lampert has advised there is evidence for in terms of self-administration. Caveating that's actually better if you um, have someone administer administer the the, the, pre, the training for you rather than self administer the training. So CST cognitive stimulation therapy is usually um, administered in the group. The individual um, program actually didn't work very well, and so it's a small group activity for people of mild to moderate dementia where they do fun things. Um, so you might read the newspaper and discuss it. They might play bowls. They might do a, you know, shopping activity. I think here they're looking at pictures and discussing them. Um, typically, the trials have had a program that runs twice a week for seven weeks. And there's enough evidence now that the NICE guidelines recommend that CST be offered to people with mild to moderate dementia. Um, so here's uh, the newest uh, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, 44 studies now with well over 2,000 people, which shows a medium effect on global cognition, again, the MMSE, immediately after um, the program, seven-week program usually, but not at one to 10-month follow-up. Um, and also a pool change of 2.41, which isn't very much on the ADAS Um Also, they're showing that CST improves memory, function, on the ADLs, depressive symptoms, and that clinical dementia rating as well. So, you know, pretty nice evidence that CST has benefits of people with dementia. It's really hard to find a CST group in Australia. There's a few places who run groups. Um, the um, Denny, uh, Brian Draper and um, the team at Prince of Wales um, did a small pilot uh, adapting um, the manuals and the, the materials for Australia. Um, so I recommend the manuals if you're interested in running a group. They've got lovely manuals with videos to run CST, um, but it's hard to find a CST group in Australia, essentially. Let me talk about cognitive rehabilitation. Um, so this is a, a, a individual program usually delivered um, in the person's home or based around the person's home. And in cognitive rehab, you apply the principles of rehab to address that person's needs at their stage of dementia. And so you goals, basically goal set. Um, so these are some of the goals in Linda Clare's, um, in Linda Clare's work. She's really been the proponent of studies of cognitive rehabilitation, such as learning to use email or developing strategies to feel confident enough to go out alone, be able to cook a meal without getting distracted, 
or for people with more moderate to severe dementia, maintaining the ability to dress herself, managing difficulties of swallowing or enabling participation in an enjoyable activity. So you get a feel for what the goals people are setting out in cognitive rehab. So even though it says cognition, cognitive rehab, the goals are functional goals. Um, there's been one big RCT uh, led by Linda Craig called the Great Cognitive Rehab Start Study, had 475 people, um, half of whom got cognitive rehab. And at three months, there were significant large positive effects on participant rated goal attainment scaling. So they set the goals and then we asked, and then the researchers asked if that met the goals. Um, this was corroborated, corroborated by informant ratings of goals as well, maintained at nine months. But really, I guess, interestingly, uh, maybe disappointingly, there were no significant effects on quality of life, mood, self-efficacy or cognition, or carer stress or quality of life. Um, so if you talk to Linda Clare, uh, cognitive rehabilitation looks, feels, is, I think, very similar to our occupational therapy intervention. Um, and there's more and more, I think, OT trials now for people with dementia. So uh, Sally Bennett's systematic review of 15 studies, 2,000 participants, found that for people with dementia, there were improvements in overall ADLs and IADLs, also a decrease in the number of changed behaviors, improvements in quality of life uh, after the intervention at, at three to six month follow-up. And for carers, they, were, they spent less time helping the person, they were less distressed by behaviors and also experienced improved quality of life. Now, there weren't many studies measuring some of these outcomes. So, you know, not all 15 studies had all these outcomes and effects were small to moderate and the interventions were almost always dyadic. Um, so the, it, it's, I guess it rely, the, the OT interventions rely on the carer supporting the person with dementia as well. Um, if you're interested in uh, supporting your people with dementia, to get OT in Australia, you can fund them through GP chronic disease management plans, only five sessions, whereas the OT um, trials typically have many more sessions than that, you know, 10 or more. Um, transitional care um, will fund uh, some OT. If the person has been in hospital, can fund it through your home care package. There's the option of private health insurance and some community rehab services will also offer OT for people with dementia. If you're looking for an OT with experience in dementia, um, you can go to OT Australia's website where you can search for people who have an interest in aging, but they can't put dementia as a specialization yet. We're trying to work on that. And I also like to commend you to the COPE Australia study led by Lindy Clemson and Kate Laver, where there's a list of COPE trained OTs. And um, yeah, so we've published the, um, the data on COPE, which is an OT intervention, showing that um, it works in um, Australia. Okay, let's talk about exercise. So there's different types of exercise. So there's walking, uh, which might be, which might count as aerobic exercise, depending on how rigorously you walk. There's resistance training, which is kind of working on muscle strength, and there's high intensity exercise, which is really rigorous and high exertion. Um, there's been lots of studies of physical exercise. This review uh, kind of put together, which is the most recent one I could find, combined people with MCI and dementia. Um, so there's 46 studies of those, uh, more than 5,000 participants. And it found that exercise reduced decline in global cognition, memory, changed behaviors, but not other cognitive functions. And there were small effects. And really that if you look at whether it was physical uh, aerobic or resistance training, that really the, the, the evidence was for aerobic exercise at moderate intensity or above. And uh, with, with duration for over 24 hours across the trial, so not exercising for 24 hours in a row, that basically has the, the greater effect on cognition, on global cognition. So I think evidence for exercise um, for people with dementia looks pretty good. Um, there were two separate papers showing no impact on ADLs or depression. So uh, if you want to find an 
exercise program for to support people with dementia in Australia. Um, it's hard to find a spe dementia specific exercise group, though there are a few out there. Um, you can definitely look, there'll be local seniors exercise groups. Um, you can fund uh, exercise physiologists or physiotherapists, again, through a GP chronic disease management plan. If the person needs help to start safe exercising, um, you could try a false prevention program like Stepping On. Uh, you can find uh, those programs. Uh, and if you're in New South Wales, which I think many of you are, um, Active and Healthy New South Wales has a list of local seniors exercise programs, which is really helpful. But if not, you will have to Google. Okay, so let me talk briefly about psychological or talking therapies, where you, I guess you um, talk about the problems and um, try and kind of, you know, resolve things that way. Uh, there is CBT, uh, cognitive behavior therapy, which is based around kind of identifying um, thoughts and feelings and changing behaviors. There's problem focused therapy where you really focus on trying to um, learn problem solving skills and find solutions to the problems. And then it's more kind of generic counseling. You, you, you build a therapeutic relationship and you kind of talk about the issues. Um, there has been a systematic review of CBT for people with dementia, 11 studies, most of them are small pilot feasibility studies, only a total of 116 participants, um, which suggests that CBT re reduces depression and anxiety symptoms. It certainly shows that it's feasible to do CBT um, with people with mild to moderate dementia, sometimes with the care involved. But I don't think that, that there's enough, I guess, data to be really confident about these results yet. Um, if you look kind of more broadly at psychotherapeutic interventions and so not just CBT, this systematic review has 24 studies of which nine involve the diets. It's got uh, 10,000 people, sorry. And this, this also included people with MCI. Um, so the MCI had dementia and sometimes they required having depression to get into the study. And it showed reductions in depression in only nine of the 17 studies. And there was mixed results in adaptation, helplessness, self-esteem, and quality of life. So even though people with dementia, carers, and maybe other and professionals are telling us that after diagnosis, they would like um, uh, psychotherapeutic support, I don't think we really know very, very well how to provide these supports and how well they work yet. Um, again, I'm reminded Dementia Australia have a post-diagnostic support program um, and that you can uh, get the psychotherapeutic services for people with dementia if they have, uh, if they meet criteria for mental, uh, mental health problem through a mental health plan. Um, and, you know, there's always private health insurance as well. So I put in red, I guess, some of the um, interventions for which there is evidence for. And I didn't talk about all of them today. We, we have evidence for them on this. And there's some things that we don't have really great evidence for, but doesn't mean that they don't work. And the challenge really is how do we, how do we provide this pathway that doesn't exist at the moment for people with dementia after diagnosis? Um, We've made a small start, I guess, and our, our small offering is Forward of Dementia, which is a website and resources for people with dementia and carers for the first 12 months after diagnosis. So it starts with helping people find the information. If they can find a website, or if you as clinicians can help them find a website, then at least it has all that information in the one place. Um, there are three sections, a section for people with dementia, a section for carers, and a section for healthcare, um, healthcare providers. Um, and this is just a sample of one of the sections on managing changes uh, for people with dementia. You, you can see that we've got an emphasis on rehabilitative strategies and therapies and really practical kind of how to get services. Um, so section 3.1, managing symptoms to achieve what's most important. Um, memory and thinking strategies and tips that other people have used. Post-it notes, but many others as well. 
talks about the therapies to help with memory and thinking. So this information I've talked about today, you know, put in um, uh, accessible, I guess, language. And, and you can see we've even we've got a section on driving. Lots of people talked about driving as well. We've made some tools for people with dementia. So um, there's questions about your diagnosis to help with, I guess, asking the doctor's information. Many people with dementia told us that um, when they got told the diagnosis and the carers, that they, they just couldn't take anything else in. And then afterwards, they had lots of questions. So, and sometimes they get, they go to the doctor and then they forgot some of the questions. So we've made a list of questions to ask the doctor. Um, we've made a, what's a very, uh, a very simple kind of goal setting life planning tool sheet that they can work on as a family and then take to the, the doctor and get help for. So it says my life goals, how dementia gets in the way, and then to do things, things that I can do to overcoming barriers. And there's information in the Forward of Dementia website to help them, I guess, find strategies. You know, always talk to the health professionals about those things as well. Like I said, people were really concerned about telling their di diagnosis to other people. So we've made a tool for that. And um, yeah, and then um, now our team were like, oh, people want all this stuff. And there's even evidence for some of this stuff. And how do we how do we meet this need? And I guess that's why we're having this conversation with you. We're running these webinars because um, people with dementia talked about this this void. You know that they were staring to the void after diagnosis. That there was nothing nothing there for them. And I think as a professional, I'm like, there's this huge gap. There's this gap between what evidence there is, you know, there's been so much research, I guess, on, on, on rehabilitation for people with dementia now, um, that there's this gap between what we know works and what, what services people can get. Uh, so how do we cross this gap? I was like, we can't just jump across and some, you know, some amazing people with dementia have educated me, uh, John, John Quinn, uh, Bobby Redman, uh, Kate Swaffer, you know, they've jumped this gap themselves. They've kind of got their allied health and figured it out. But surely we can't all expect people to just figure it out themselves. Um, so we need to build this bridge. We need to build this system that provides post-diagnostic support. Um, and I don't think we can just make this bridge straight away. I, I believe that, you know, the dementia policy team, the Department of Health are really keen. We're seeing more funding, I guess, for post-diagnostic support, but they can't just put money in it. We really need to change, I guess, systems and practices. So, you know, here we are. We need to give information to people with dementia and carers around what they could have and how to get it. That's what we're trying to do on our website. Um, if you're a diagnostician, you know, tell, tell people, give them hope. People, people with dementia and carers said, we want hope, give them hope. Um, GPs and practice nurses, you know, they we haven't we haven't started working with them closely. But if you've got any here, we love GPs and practice nurses, and we see them as really key in supporting people with dementia after diagnosis. Um, we need to influence more policymakers, I guess, around maybe uh, dementia MBS items, more allied health, uh, more allied health visits. Five is definitely not enough. Everyone has podiatry; that's one already. Um, uh, allied health practitioners. Uh, from, you know, the university degree to upskilling people working with dementia, their confidence, knowing how to support people with dementia. Um, so we've been training for well, the COPE team, Kate Laver and Sally Day have been training um, OTs around supporting people with dementia. And we, you know, we need more of these kind of post postgraduate little, little courses to help allied health practitioners upskill in working with people with dementia as well. So your hands, I guess, this is our conversation with you, your hands can help people cross that big gap for the first time. And um, I don't think Cognizance Forward Dementia can do this. I feel like this could be a collective effort to, um, to build this, these post-diagnostic services. Um, and so to close, I'm hoping that when you see the word dementia, you think of the word dementia, you'll have those thoughts first and then you also think, but there is stuff we can do, and you know we can change things, and and uh, we and, and rehab does work for people with dementia. We just need to make a system so that every person with dementia 
gets to rehab after diagnosis. I would like to thank our team, a wonderful team, um, Henry, Lynn Phillipson, Yunhee John, Meredith Gresham, and our uh, international collaborators who've been really wonderful to work with on this project, and you for coming. And I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully have a conversation with you about how you think we can, um, you know, build this bridge of post-diagnostic support. Well, thanks so much for such an engaging um, presentation, Lee Fei. And um, it's great to hear about just the wide variety of interventions that are being trialled and the encouraging evidence that is emerging from so many of them about the difference that these kinds of health services and interventions can make to people who've been diagnosed with dementia. Um, we've got a few questions that are coming in via the Q&A section on the website, a few that are in the chat as well. But if anyone has any specific questions for the panel, either for Lee Falo or for Professor Henry Bridati, who's also joined us, um, please enter those into the Q&A section um, so that we can make sure that your questions get answered. Um, I'm going to actually start with a question that is currently in the chat, which is coming from um, Vasi Naganathan. Um, and he says, Lee Fei, that his opening line to people when introducing these things would be, let's look at what we can do to improve yours and your carer's quality of life. But Vasi feels it would be wrong to say any of these me measures will stop the dementia from getting worse in what a lay person means when they ask this, which is, often what he feels he's asked as a diagnostician and he's wondering about your view on this and I'm sure he'd be interested in Henry's as well. You want to have a go first Henry or I, I can take it? Yeah Lisa it's your show yeah. Oh so um, people with dementia and carers have been telling us that after diagnosis they want a balanced realistic kind of they want balanced, realistic information, but also hope. So I wouldn't say, there's no evidence to say that any of these stop dementia, right? It, it, like, and, uh, but it makes a small difference, I think it would be realistic. So uh, I think that, that talking about function and quality of life and living well and kind of offering supports towards that rather than a cure or something that's going to stop people from getting worse, I think is a realistic and kind of honest way of offering rehabilitation. Yeah, Darcy, I think people go, we know people go away feeling lost, feeling in a void, feeling confused. And if we can give them a plan, as Lee Fei says, a realistic plan, look, we can't cure it. We can help maintain quality of life, exactly as you're saying, Darcy. And, um, you know, being realistic, but having something, something that they can do, something they can actually take control of their disease, their condition, and feel in control and feel empowered. And then know it's not just nothing when they leave the consulting room. That's the, that's the aim. And also for the family care, it's knowing that there's something they can do and giving something in writing because they'll forget everything when they walk out of that room. Great. I can see a comment um, in the chat from Bobby Redman. Um, Bobby's been involved in our co-design groups in this project. So thanks, Bobby, for your involvement and your support of, of the project. Bobby has said, as the person um, diagnosed with dementia in the chat, if we can retain our functioning for longer by taking action, that gives us hope even if we recognise that there is no cure. And I think this is a really important point that certainly in the research that we did as part of this project, the people we interviewed said it was, it was the loss of hope, the depression, the worry, the lack of support and information that they felt was contributing to their deterioration. And we certainly know that support, that, that experiencing those symptoms are, and, and that lack of support and that void is only going to make people's dementia symptoms worse as well. So I think if we're thinking holistically, those interventions are definitely going to make a, um, make a big difference to people. Okay, there's a few questions coming in via the Q&A that are actually about other sorts of interventions and factors that you haven't covered in today's talk, Lee Fei. Um, 
The first one is, does sleep hygiene, hygiene play a role in developing rehabilitation skills? I know that people with dementia um, often have um, difficulties with sleeping. I have not reviewed the evidence around sleep interventions for people with dementia. I think Sharon may space. Henry's hands up. Henry knows the answer. Go ahead. There, there was a paper by McCurry, I think, from memory, which did show that there was an intervention. I don't know what he did or she did uh, to do that. But uh, yes, there, there are some interventions, and this uh, researcher, Sharon. Uh, Naismith has been mainly looking at sleep interventions to prevent dementia rather than as a rehabilitation measure. That's an area that needs further exploration. And can I just jump in with something else? Somebody's written in a very good comment that these interventions seem very metrocentric. Um, in other words, what can be offered for people in rural and remote areas? And Lee Fay, I thought that might be something you could address. Yeah. So we have talked to some people in regional areas as part of Cumsons, and I realised that even getting a GP is really difficult. Um, yeah, I can see someone talking about telehealth. So we're seeing more telehealth interventions uh, for people with dementia. Uh, Kate Labor trialed um, COPE, telehealth COPE. Um, so I suspect that accelerated by COVID that we might see more telehealth kind of interventions, which I know doesn't, isn't for everyone because some people don't like the internet, don't want the internet, but um, I, I, I would hope that telehealth would maybe give more accessibility some of these interventions. And certainly I would suspect that all of them, even group exercise, I know people are trying now tele, by telehealth. Great, and Lee Fei, um... Uh, Lorna Huang has actually specifically said at War Memorial Hospital, they have trialled a Zoom version of the iReady course and, and it worked well and it, it could be accessed by people in the country or anywhere. So we've seen um, a, a link in there for the COPE program for, for um, people and we've also seen that link to the War Memorial um, Hospital um, program as well. So people can get some of that information from the, from the chat as well. Okay, a couple of other questions about things that impact um, or that could play a role in rehabilitation. There's a question from an anonymous attendee about the role that CBD oil may, be, may play in cognitive rehabilitation process. Henry, do you know the answer to CBD yeah, oil? Yeah, um, we have uh, we've tried three times to get a grant to look at this unsuccessfully, but not for rehabilitation, mainly for the treatment of uh, agitation. So I don't know of any roles for cannabinoid oils in, uh, in rehabilitation. There has been a study, uh, two studies published with Nabalone from the Canadians, uh, led by uh, Crystal Langtot, uh, showing benefits for Nabalone uh, over placebo in reducing agitation. Obviously not a first line treatment. Uh, it seems to work well. Um, mix, we had a great preparation in with uh, Ian McGregor from the, uh, oh, the, the Institute at Kidney University, the Ling, 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 I've um, forgot, forgotten for the moment, but uh, that, that's the great thing about this. Um, but, uh, and there may be some benefits against the amyloid with some of these uh, cannabinoids or, or with THC itself, but not for rehabilitation, I don't think. Yeah. Okay, there's another question about the, the impact of hearing on the rehabilitation process. We probably need to make sure that the person has their hearing aids sorted, that they can hear. Um, we, we know quite a lot about kind of environment, and I didn't talk about it, but environmental supports for people with dementia. And certainly, you know, even making sure that your environment is uh, has the right level of noise or the, a lower level of noise can really support people with dementia in, um, I guess, during your sessions, but, you know, otherwise. So looking at noise levels and that person's hearing is important as part of, I guess, a supportive environment. Okay. Um, Anne Tunks is wondering um, what sorts of advice we can um, provide for carers who are trying to introduce these sorts of activities into the life of a person with dementia um, who may not be very motivated or see 
have the insight into why these activities might help them and whether you have any advice about overcoming this kind of resistance? I mean, the best thing you could do is get an OT home visit and have the hope, you know, an OT kind of help, I guess, figure out what things the person with dementia is interested in now, how to motivate them, and then, you know, support the carer to have the activity at the right level of difficulty to introduce it in the right way. I think it's hard to give generic advice, except that, you know, an OT is good at this stuff. So is there any other evidence? One of the questions says for therapies or approaches to address apathy or low motivation. Henry, can you remember? We looked at this a while ago, right? Sorry, I, I was reading the chat. I, I, yes, go on. What's the, what, what evidence is there for intervention specifically to target apathy for people with dementia? Oh, yes. Um, well, in the pharmacological studies, there's uh, one that just came out like a few weeks ago using methylphenidate, um, and that was from the US and Canada, it was a joint one. Um, and it was, it's, it was okay. It, it was somewhat better than the placebo group. The placebo group also had quite a bit of benefit too, but more evidence is for the non-pharmacological side of things where you have structured intervention, structured activities for the person. I, I tell family members, it's like you're the prosthetic frontal lobe. You have to be the organizer. Turn on the ignition key and, you know, try and work out some structure with the person and uh, you know, take it slowly and slowly, slowly increase. But there, there's certainly more room for apathy interventions. It's an area I'm particularly interested in. And uh, so, uh, yeah. And by the way, the, if you want to look up about the cannabinoid research, there's the Lambert Initiative at Sydney University, Lambert Initiative. Right. Okay, so we've, we've heard about um, therapies to address sort of psychological symptoms. There's an interesting question in the Q&A that's come from Jane Thompson, and she's wondering about how important it is for um, interventions or programs that might actually focus on understanding the, the, the changing relationships that occur for people who are diagnosed with dementia. Um, I think that if you delve into the detail of some of those psychological therapies, you'll see that some of them are dyadic and certainly addressed. Um, uh, and so some of them did look at those changes in relationships. Our small pilot study of um, post-diagnostic counselling, uh, all the, almost all the people brought their families in, which wasn't uh, a, you know, it wasn't a, a key component. They didn't have to, but they all wanted to talk to their families about dementia. And I suspect that if we had run a, a program for carers, that they would also want to talk about those change relationships. So, yeah, Jay, I think that changing natures of relationships is really important. And while we didn't cover um, carer support programs today, I know that some carer programs, they also talk about that as well. Henry wants to talk. Um, I just want to let you know about a novel intervention that's being trialled by Suresh uh, Santani, who works with me at uh, Chiba. And he's looking at social skills training for people with dementia. And we know that uh, some people, particularly certain types of dementia, social skills diminish as the dementia progresses. And so training people, because we know that social health can be a preventative factor against dementia, whether it can have an effect on the quality of life and the um, progression of dementia in people with already established dementia is unknown. But uh, that program has just started and he's employed an OT to help with that. And uh, that's underway and it's going to be a, a trial. And the, the carers or the family person is allowed, is can come or not come as, as desired. Uh, and we'll wait and see, but it's a new area, Jane, and uh, it's an important area. I mean, the other area that there isn't much research on is sex, sexuality, I guess, is an extension of that relationship in people with dementia. Um, and we don't know how to support that, really. We don't even know how to ask the question, I think, probably. But it's certainly something that people will want to talk about. Okay. There's a lot of very interesting comments in the chat. People 
putting in, you know, useful references, including a few articles actually in there around communication partner training. Um, we've had a few requests about whether or not we can include all these useful links. And so I've, uh, I'll, I promise that we'll do our best if we can when we contact you after the webinar with our evaluation survey um, to see if we can include any useful links that were part of the, the, the chat. Um, yeah. Can I comment? Communication partner training is like there's lots of lovely evidence for it in um, uh, like te uh, traumatic brain injury and other kind of uh, conditions where people have communication issues. So it really makes sense to 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 support carers and families in how they communicate with people with dementia. And I think that's the nice message study uh, in residential care where you can support. Uh, paid staff to to better communicate with people with dementia as well. I think what's really interesting is we also see a lot of work on the use of communication aids and tools, um, things like talking mats in other areas where people experience neurodegenerative conditions that affect their communication, but we don't see that as much in dementia. And I think it is another area that where we could be doing some more work to support people's communication as well. Yeah, and a shout out to the great speech pathologists out there um, we, we need more, I think, more evidence around speech pathology. I feel like it's a great need for people with dementia, just not many studies yet. Okay, so we probably have a couple of minutes for any other questions if people want to pop anything else in the Q&A &A, um, question area. I just am wondering as we kind of finish up, Lefe, we've heard about so many different um, opportunities that there are for us to provide information supports. And I'm wondering at the end of the, the session today, whether you could answer a question about what really are the key services and supports that people should be linked to at that point of diagnosis, whether you could just give us a, a, a summary or, of what it would be great if people went away with some information in their hands about from their um, diagnostic interview. So people need it written is the first thing. And ideally they, they would leave with a plan, but sometimes they're not really in, you know, in the space to even have a plan, but they need to know where to come back to to make a plan if they can't live with a plan. I think they need the number for Dementia Australia and they need to understand, I guess, what Dementia Australia can provide. I'd love them to have Forward of Dementia, a website so that they can go there. It's a non-threatening way. Some people are not ready to accept the diagnosis and they just want to read and lurk. They don't want to reach out yet. Uh, people told us that as well. Um, and they need to know um, where to go, I guess, for, to ask questions. So whether they go back to the diagnostician or they go back to the doctor, I feel like they need to know what the next step is that they need to take. And a plan would be fantastic. Fantastic. Written down. Fantastic. Okay. So it's getting to that time. So I guess on behalf of the Forward with Dementia team, I really do want to thank you all for your attendance today. You know, we had over 100 people tune into this webinar and I think it shows you just how important this reframing of the dementia diagnosis is. We've hope, we hope that you've heard today some things that might inspire you to join us and become part of a movement in Australia that aims to make the prescription and provision of support for people with dementia central to routine practices for people following a diagnosis. We really do want that this to be the new normal. We want to encourage you to follow us, um, to visit our website, follow us on our social media um, channels, sign up for our newsletter and review the information and resources that we've co-developed with people with dementia and their carers and with health professionals to really address this gap that we've identified for information, support and resources in the first 12 months following a diagnosis. So please spread the word, promote and use the resources we've developed to your colleagues and to your patients. Um, we're going to send you an evaluation survey following this webinar, and we're also going to provide you with um, 
an order form in case there are any resources that you'd like for your own clinic or your practice to promote the Forward with Dementia campaign and resources to the patients that visit your um, clinic. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar and you'd like to watch some of the others that we have developed, you can also um, uh, subscribe to the Forward with Dementia YouTube channel. So, um, we thank you again for joining us as part of today's webinar. We really do look forward to engaging with you forward during this, uh, further during this project. And together, we really believe that we can reframe the dementia diagnostic experience and help people to move forward beyond their diagnosis. Thanks for joining us today and we'll see you soon.